everyone this morning. Yes, Amen. and if you're visiting for the first time, this lovely girl is my wife, Jenny, and she was ready to jump in. Actually, did it better than the video. So that was awesome. Good morning, everyone. Would you please meet me in the book of Revelation chapter 1? And I just want to follow up with... Um, well, what, what Jenny was just saying about um, the prayer walk and the importance of prayer, you know, everything, would you say this with me? Everything begins with prayer. That's true of this church, and it's true of your life, and it's true of the kingdom of God. Everything begins with prayer, amen? And so it's a great reminder, and uh, the writer of Hebrews, and I will be referring a lot to uh, Hebrews today, but he says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So, pastor, why are you guys walking through the streets? Are you, like, grabbing people, gathering information? Are you handing out flyers? Are you, like, acting one of those JWs? Like, what are you guys doing? Are we just praying? Why do you do that? Um, because everything begins with prayer. Amen? And as a result, we have seen God do great things, and I believe that he honors his word, and he says, call out to me, and I will, I will show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. So I want to know the things that I do not know, and I want to hear them from the Lord. I want to see God do great and awesome things in our church and in your lives and for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. So we must have faith, and we must draw near to the Lord. We must believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him, who faithfully seek him. Amen? And so we are, as a church, uh, up against a very significant potential situation that has 99.9 .9 possibilities. The only 0.01 possibility is that um, there I have, has not been ink on paper yet, but there is agreement uh, across the parties. And because it is a delicate matter, I want to have the paper signed before I tell you, but I am calling because this is important and because everything begins with prayer. Uh, this Wednesday, we do not have life group, and I would like to call a day, Tuesday, this Tuesday, because this Tuesday is when the meetings are going to take place, a, a church-wide day of prayer. Can we do that? Amen. For what, pastor? <laughs> For a new location. For a home, because we're maxed out here. Our option is to go back to two services, but we do not have rooms for our kids. And so the Lord has opened up a great opportunity, even better than the one I was thinking about three weeks. So because there's so, me so much, this whole thing continues to go like this. I don't want to drag everybody with, you know, through all the details. Just let's pray. Amen? Amen. And you know what? If the Lord says no, even though everything looks like yes right now, we know that we prayed and it was the Lord who said no. I have no reason to think that it's no. All I'm saying is, being in this church for 11 years has taught me that God is in charge. Amen. And he surprises us with things that he never told us about. And then he says, pray for this. And then, and then he fulfills it in his timing. Amen? Yeah. So we're trusting his timing. Would you commit to praying this Tuesday? Why? For the church. For what? For a new place. And uh, it looks really good. It's going to be a blessing for our church. I cannot wait. Amen? Yeah. But I think the Lord wants to include us. So, we, so you can say, you know, I prayed and the Lord did that. Amen? I truly, truly encourage you to join us on Saturday at 10 a.m. We're going to do it until, until Easter. Uh, so when you see God do awesome things, you can say, He's doing it, it's His glory, but I remember walking and praying and God doing awesome. I have the joy of being a part of that. So if you can walk and if you can pray, there's no reason why you can't be uh, here. But stay tuned because we're not always meeting in the same place. We've already covered about Three quarters of Miami Shores. We only have a little piece of left of Miami Shores, and we're going to go to Airport Town, Biscayne Park, and then we're going to continue. Amen? How awesome, how awesome to know that you're not a believer, and two, two years from now, you go, you're going to be a believer. And a year and a half, and two years and a half from that day, you're going to find out that there was some people that loved the Lord and loved you enough to walk through your streets. 
Instead of cursing and listening to music that, and just all the crazy and the nonsense that happens to your street, there was these simple people that just walked through your street and they looked at my house and they said, Father, I don't know who lives in 475, but I ask you, Lord God, that your purposes will be fulfilled. I pray, Father God, that you bring sinners to repentance. I pray, Father God, that you will restore marriages and whatever is going on there. And as we begin to do that, you know, we activate the presence in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You don't know how to pray, but he will show you how to pray. I'm not saying you're going to hear an audible voice, pray for Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, but you will feel prompted from the, a prompting from the Holy Spirit to pray in this way. That has nothing to do. It's really funny. I got to go walking with my wife yesterday, and it was the cutest thing. I never told her because I didn't want to embarrass, but she compliments every house that she walks in front of before she prays. I'm like, I didn't, I've been doing this now for a little while. I don't tell the Lord how pretty the house looks or how nice manicure the landscaping is, but she does. And I guess that kind of helps her prayer. It just kind of connects them. And as she was doing that, I kind of felt a little closer to those people who live in that house that I was just praying, Lord, that guy right there and this one, Father, bring fire. Lord, bring blessing. Do something. I don't care. I don't call. I don't, I don't know. Sometimes I notice the color of the door, but that's it, you know. But she compliments their... Um, their taste in prayer. So that's a beautiful thing. Anyways, um, if you are just joining us, we are, um, this is sermon three on the first part of three parts uh, in the book of Revelation. And um, what's peculiar about this uh, study, this series, is that we're not in a hurry. Amen. We're not in a rush. So I set out to finish today the unveiling, and then we may take a quick uh, pause, and then we'll come back to the letters to the churches, which is called overcomers. Oh, oh. Overcomers. overcomers. Sometimes my girl one gets in the way, man. Um, and um, that's going to be awesome, and then we're going to get, we're going to hit Easter, uh, and then we're going to go back to the, the future, <laughs> and that's going to be amazing. We're trusting God to, uh, that he's doing a great work in your Life, but um, revelation means it's, it's a comes from a Greek word apocalypse, which does apocalypse, which does not mean scary things that happen in the dark. It doesn't mean that. It means the unveiling, the uncovering of what, the uncovering of Jesus, the uncovering of the truth, and the uncovering of the future. That's what it is about. So this first. Uh, portion, which is only chapter 1, the unveiling, is the uncovering, the uncovering of Jesus, what I just read to you, the Alpha and the Omega, the one that Romans says that from Him and through Him are all things, that to Him is the glory now and forever. The glory will always be His. Amen, right? He is the visible image of the invisible God, according to Colossians. He existed before all things, and everything was created, and He's supreme over all things. So this first part, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, who, who, who abides in unsearchable light, yet reveals a portion, enough for us to just fall on the ground like John and say, woe is me. I am about to die. I can't contain this much information, this much glory, this much beauty, this much power. It is also about the truth. The truth of what? Well, the truth of your life, the practical truth of our lives, but according to the eyes and the purposes of God. Since we are not self-created, somebody say, not self-created. Self Do you remember when you decided that you were going to be and you chose the color of your hair and how tall you were going to be and who you, did you remember any of that? We were not self-created. The Lord, He is God, He made us and we are His people according to Psalm 100, right? And so we um, are His and so um, this book tells us the truth about ourselves before Him, how we stand and what He desires because we're His, right? Yeah. Just like if you make anything, you have a purpose for it and you desire to function in a certain way. 
That's all we're talking about. Very practical. Those are the seven letters to the churches. And then the future. The future of what, Pastor? Of everything and everyone. Everything and everyone. This is not an American thing. Stop tying what we're reading to like, what's going on in the Capitol building? It's not an American thing. It may or may not have anything to do with it. The end of all things of this present age. And the beginning of an eternal reign, the reign of Christ. So why do I need to know this? If you ask yourself, okay, I'm in. I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know more about myself. And I want to know about the future, right? Why do I need to know this? And the answer is in order to be ready for the imminent return of Christ. Because you need to be ready. Because you... You, you must be saved. You must be found approved before the Lord so that you may hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen? Amen. Speaking of prayer, just a quick tangent. Would you pray for Gavin? There's nothing wrong with him. He's, he just took a job that puts him working on Sunday for not a job. He's trying to be a captain of a ship. And the courses are on, a, on Sunday, so he can't be here for like three weeks. And I didn't think we were going to miss him that much. You all miss him? Because that worship was missing Gavin. It wasn't missing Jesus, just missing that sort of subjective part of our hearts that we like to hear a beat, especially when he's done like that. But maybe the Lord, maybe there's a drummer here that you guys can play next Sunday. All right? I just need more amen. That's what my point of saying. Amen. <laughs> so um, John tells us, uh, on the second verse, that he, uh, that God gave him uh, these words, the, w- the word of a book of Revelation, um, things that was that must m- soon take place. And I think this is an important point before we get into the, the the main bulk of the message. It must soon take place. We must realize the eminence, the 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 reality of these events. Sometimes we read soon and we think it means, okay, so it happened, it was set now, I should expect it in 15 minutes. And it is helpful sometimes, you know, when those of you who speak more than one language, you could say, sort of literally uh, transfer the same word over, but it doesn't mean the same thing in that context. So this is one of those cases. The word here in Greek is this de en tajos, right, which means, tajos means immediate, sudden. This is where the word we get the this is where we get the word tachometer. You know what a tachometer is? It's an instrument that you use for measuring speed. The root of the word tachycardia, which is fast heartbeat, heart rate. Tachos means sudden. It means it will happen. And a good way to explain it is like this. And the ladies will really get it. Those who are moms, remember being pregnant? Remember finding out? And setting out this thing is going to be like nine months long. And there are weeks that nothing happens. And there are weeks that you're really uncomfortable. And the belly is growing because the baby is growing. And there's some ups and some downs. And you don't know where it's coming, but the clock is ticking. And this is imminent. Is she going to blow up? Remember the first time Jenny was praying? What's going to happen? You know, I've never done this before. She keeps getting bigger and bigger. How is this going to come out? And, and Lord, are you sure? Like, what if my baby is the one exception that doesn't come out? And you worry and you're like, all these crazy thoughts that go through your mind. But at the right time... And the kairos, at the right, at the point in time, it is eminent that the mother's body is assigned to go into labor. And it will happen. And guess what? Once, it, once the water breaks, once she goes into labor, there's no turning back. Have you ever heard anyone in the middle of labor say, you know what, let me become unpregnant? You can't, right? So that's what John wants us to know. This is what Jesus is telling us. It doesn't mean that immediately it's going to happen. It means that it is like a pregnancy, like a full term. And when, it, it, when you see that it's about to happen, get ready because it will happen suddenly and there's no turning back. There's no do-over. 
There's not, let me be 40 again. No, let me go back to high school and change those events. Let me, let me not ignore the message of the preacher. Let me, you can't. And we must be ready because it is eminent that the Lord will return. Amen. Amen. And so it's a big deal. It's a big deal. But the book of Revelation is uh, throughout history has had um, interesting. I know another time we're in for the long haul, so I'll bring some um, uh, historical um, sort of uh, reactions to this book. But I, do, I found this quote this week from Pastor Louis Talbot. And I, and I want to read this to you. It says, The devil has turned thousands of people away from this portion of God's Word. He does not want anyone to read a book that tells of his, cast out of, of his casting out of heaven, nor is he anxious for us to read of the ultimate triumph of his number one enemy, Jesus. And then he continues, the more you study the book of Revelation, the more you understand why Satan fights so hard to keep God's people away from it. It is the book of the Bible that promises a blessing. But it is the most obscure book of the Bible, is it not? I mean, people take drugs and read it just just to trip back in the 60s or whatever, right? People use it as points of reference to make sci-fi movies. And so you think, oh, I'm reading. I saw that in the movies. That was like a cheesy, like cartoonish, not even close to the real thing. And these are all these distractions from you really getting God's word. Amen? Amen. So um, a quick, very quick recap. Uh, um, We began on verse 9 and we made it through verse 12. So today we're going to go verse 13 through 20, but he says, I was in the spirit, verse 10, in the Lord, on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So on Sunday morning, as he was worshiping God in the spirit, he was listening, and this is what, he's, this is what he heard. Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, per- Pergamum, uh, Tyra, Uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so, verse 12, And then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden uh, stands. You're going to get ready for this pattern, because it will continue to happen. I heard, and then I turned, and I saw something different. That happens, that pattern happens throughout this book time and time again. And so, since we're going to talk about Jesus today and His church, and we read through this passage, I want to sort of bring, um, bring verse 19 and 20, so this is part two of last Sunday's sermon, and I just kind of want to clarify that, put it up front, that way we will stay just verse 13 through 18, okay? So verse 19, Jesus gives us the outline of the book. In other words, everything that I told you that is about revelation, things, and and the future, Jesus told me. He told us, all right? I didn't come up with that. Um, He says, verse 19, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. You see it? Three parts. The things that you have seen, the revelation of Jesus, the things that are sort of like a, a you know, state of the union, sort of, you know, like this is who we are and this is where we're at and this is who God is, and then the things that are going to happen after this. And then verse 20 kind of reveals a mystery, and I want us to have, be clear on that, and then we'll go back to verse 13. As for the mystery of the seven stars, I just love that. Like Jesus knows that he told John something that is causing John's mind to be like, what does this mean? What is this, right? So he answers. And some things he doesn't answer, but this one he explains it. And he says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So... The angels, this is why I cut the sermon last week short. I didn't want to get to this part. I'm just teasing. Most biblical, that was funny. Gavin, hey, most biblical commentators and scholars agree that 
um, the angels there is not an angel of God. It means uh, the pastor, sort of the leader, the, leader, the main leader of, the, of each of those churches. And so when I saw it, I'm like, I'm not an angel of you. One proof of that, just talk to my wife. I don't really want to preach through that, you know. But the word angelos means messenger. This is why in the Christmas story that we just studied, in this, that we just went through in December, it says the angel of the Lord. To make it clear, it's an, it is a spiritual being that is not from here. But here it uses the same word, the same Greek word, angelos, which means messenger. The messenger. And so Paul speaks about a polarity of elders in the church, which we do have, but he picks out of one of that polarity of elders, and he singles them out. Um, historians believe that those pastors came from Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, would go to Patmos, pick up the letter, the telegram, and, and bring it back to the church. So he, he, the messenger, that's what the word means, angels. But believe me, it was traumatic for me, even though it just means messenger. It doesn't mean that you're an angel. But um, I don't want to make too much light of it because the weight of it is that I stand here um, as a messenger of the Lord. And in my ability, that's just not good enough. It's not good enough. And so I need God's help and His uh, power and, uh, <laughs> to, to do the things that I, that I don't know how to do, to reveal and to show us more of Himself. And so the church at large needs faithful pastors. Would you agree? Amen. The global church needs faithful pastors. And this church needs your pastor to be better and better, a better messenger. Amen. Amen. So would you pray for me? Even would you pray for me that today as I'm bringing God's word? And would you pray for me and for Jenny and for our kids? Not that I want to be the center of your attention, but if you really want to hear from the Lord, it would do you well that, that I do, I'd be, I'd be the best messenger, the best angelos that I could be for the Lord. Amen. Father, I pray um, for our time together and I even pray for me after hearing so many amens from your bride, this church. And um, I pray, Lord, uh, in submission to your authority, to your word, that we will make much of Jesus this morning. And that he will be exalted and glorified, that we will behold him. So, Spirit of God, um, um, allow me to shrink back and you be greater and make, Lord, all of our ears ready to hear and our hearts receptive and allow our eyes to see as these things are unveiled before us. We bless you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the churches are represented as a lampstand. These, this is a vessel. This is a, a, an instrument that holds light. And the unique quality of this Lampstand is that is golden. And so verse 13 through 18 is full of symbolism. It's full of this is what it means, this is what it means. And so um, the church, what that means is that the church, the function of the church um, is to be light in this world. The church is supposed to be light in this world. The Lord wants us to stand in this present darkness. The church is, according to Ephesians, the bride of Christ who is supposed to be pure and radiant and beautiful and perfect. You shine as light in the world, says Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Psalm 16 says, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom there is my delight. It's in that amazing, that God's desire for you, God's, when I see my kids, I, I kind of project, I saw uh, the Joneses uh, eating little boy today, I said, he's going to be a tall boy, and my mind went like this, like 20 years, and I pictured him sort of looking like his dad, or maybe a little bit taller, and having the, his mom's charm, and all of that, you look forward, right, you sort of project, well, the Lord does the same thing with his church, and with us, and guess what? My impression of what your child is going to look like is probably so off. 
But Jesus' view of us is certain, and He is doing it. And uh, so we stand as pure in the midst of corruption. We stand as light in the midst of darkness. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that we are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So for the church uh, to stand bright and for the church to be pure in this present age, this church needs Jesus. He is a source of light. The light that those lampstands is holding came from him. He touched them with his finger and he gave them light. Just like how my life was in darkness before I met him. And I don't stand here perfect, but he resides in me. And now I've been transformed and I've been renewed and continually have these encounters with one who is awesome and powerful and mighty and holy who's transforming me. And all of you would say the same thing, amen? And so that's what his view and that's what the lamb stands, that's where the gold means purity and, and for that we need Jesus to be in the midst of us. Move on to verse 13. In the midst of the lamb stand, one like a son of man. It's awesome to think that John had not seen Jesus for about 60 years. Right? He hadn't seen him anymore. Maybe he recalled in his in his mind, and he sort of retold himself what he looked like and remembered moments with him, but he had not seen him. And all of a sudden, he sees this vision, and he identifies him, and he says, it is him, the Son of Man, Jesus. So for there, for, I have seven things that this verse is. So number one, Jesus, this is what it means, Jesus is present to empower his church. We're going to look through this description. We're going to ask ourselves, what does this mean? We're going to, you know, we calculate, we, we, we associate, right? It means that Jesus is present for what? That he's here means what? To empower his church. He stands in the middle of the church. It is a picture of the presence of Jesus. He is in the midst of her to embolden his church, to empower his church. Zephaniah 3.17, do you know that verse? That says, the Lord your God is in your midst. And he is mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. You see that? The Lord over his church rejoicing, pure, empowering His church, letting us know that yes, <laughs> yes, for in Him all things are yes and amen. amen. Psalm 46 says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Jesus said, Matthew 28, on the Great Commission, and behold, I am with you always. How long? All the way to the end of the age. Jesus is in the middle. It's in his church. And Jesus is also, because we are his church, this building is not the church. The Sunday morning event it does, is not his church. Jesus is also in the middle of your circumstances. Do you realize that? Isn't that what prayer means? Isn't that how you actually arrived here? Because he's real in your life for what? To empower you. To overcome sin in your life. To, the, to, to enable you to glorify him. To encourage you in the way that you should go. He has given you his spirit to enable every effort that you take on to bring it about to fruition. If you can say today, Pastor, I'm just like me. Not perfect, but I'm not who I was six months ago. Really, how was that? How'd that happen? It's him. How, 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 did you, how actually did you give that up? Because you wouldn't for anything. I met one. 
who knows me better than I know myself. And that was enough. Amen. And so here's a description. He says, he was clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. What does that mean? Number two, Jesus stands as priest ministering to his church. He stands as priest. He's not sitting down. He's actively, as a priest, interceding. This is an image of the Levitical priest. God had ordered and told Moses, this is how uh, I want them to uh, dress, and this is how I want them to um, uh, behave, and they're supposed to be interceding for my on, on behalf of the people. They're supposed to um, um, offer the sacrifice, um, the offering for the atonement of sin. That means intercession. A golden sash is royalty, is purity, is perfect. The high priest will go um, into the Holy of Holies and offer um, a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Well, we, because of Jesus only, we don't need that anymore. Amen. Hebrews 4 teaches us that since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Amen. not just the, lo- the chosen location of his presence in a time and space that God chose for a specific people, but he actually passed through the heavens. Amen. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Jesus is there, and he's clothed and walking and active like a priest. And he is your priest. And he calls you to be a priest in his church. He made us a kingdom of priests. It is the office of intercession, not the office of ruling over the land like the king. It is not the office of foretelling the future and speaking on his behalf like the prophets. It is the office of the priest, which means to abide and reside and remain in the presence of God. So Jesus, too, stands with you, and he intercedes for you on your behalf. Whatever trial you may be facing today, whatever fire you may be going through He is in it with you. Whatever storm you are being attacked by, whatever situation in your life, He is interceding for you. In the the time of solace and peace, He is there. And when you feel that He's not there, He says, call on me, and I will show you great and unsearchable things. If you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. For what? Why is he among us? Why is he acting like a priest? For the forgiveness of your sins that you need to be able to stand pure before God and before man. He makes intercessions on our behalf. He gives us his righteousness before the Father by being the lamb that was slain for us. Holy Lamb of God. Verse 14, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. This means, point number three, Jesus preserves himself holy to make his church holy. His hair, the hair of his head is white like wool, like snow. This is an image of the ancient of days. 
We don't admire and we don't appreciate white hair anymore in this society, but typically um, white hair is a symbol of wisdom, of endurance, of stability, of, um, and John Mason is looking, yes, like John Mason <laughs> is nodding. Uh, and, 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 and so perfection, John, holiness, right? And his eyes were like a flame of fire. What? He sees everything. He can discern through our excuses and the little lies that we tell ourselves. It's like fire. They consume. They pierce through. He sees beneath our makeup and our outfit and our posturing and our what we want people to think of us, he sees that. And his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. Again, brass is a symbol of judgment. The Old Testament tabernacle I was just referring to, it was the altar. An animal was killed and bled in the altar of brass. The brass altar is a place where sin was judged. And so Jesus walks amongst, among us, having lived a sinless life for us, so that if you believe in Him, you will have eternal life. There may be someone here who has heard of Jesus. Perhaps wants to know about Jesus, but there's a major contradiction between what's here and what's here. It just doesn't seem to, to flow. It's like two separate things. We try to do good things and we try to make ourselves better. And we think that if we are more like what I'm reading by my efforts, then I'm going to be like that. And... Today I want to tell you that no matter how hard you try, you're never going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. It's not because you're worse than anybody. You're not. Right. It, because God is holy. Yeah. And our efforts are just not good enough. But God so loved this world where you and I live that He gave His Son. And if you believe... If you believe, if you believe that He is the Son of God, you will have eternal life. Yeah. If you made that a personal decision to follow Him today, and you begin to walk with the Jesus of the Bible, not the cultural Jesus, He will transform you, and this stuff will really make a lot of sense. And it begins with just a personal decision. At the end of this morning, be ready for me to call you, not call you out, but invite you to say, by the way, church means being called out, so nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, um, to invite you to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow Jesus, but, but you need forgiveness of your sins. More, more money and more sex and more fun and more wealth and more beauty and more whatever, it's not going to do it. Um, and once you're satisfied, then you can enjoy whatever. Yeah, keep eating and whatever. But that's not your salvation point anymore. Amen? And so, um, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. I love this one. You see that? What does this voice sound like? It's like the roar of many waters. Point number four, Jesus speaks with a commanding voice to lead his church. Jesus speaks with a commanding voice, with authority to lead his church, like the captain of a ship. Is everything spelled correctly there? He heals, he corrects, he speaks with a clear word. I've never read this. I'm just going to go on a limb here, take it or leave it. 
But this, you know, my background being a music, you know, composer and all of that, picture this. He says that the voice sounds like the sounds of many waters, like the rippling effect of multiple individual little things. And you ask yourself, how is it, in the, how is it that God is able to hear my prayer in, the, in front of like trillions of people? How is it that he's able to speak in such a way that I singularly understand what he's saying to me and somebody else heard what he had to hear and she understood what she had to understand? It's like a voice that contains a multiplicity of messages for individual ripples that are all part of the same. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Like a cacophony that actually is not cacophony is awesome. Yeah. Have you heard the tuning of the orchestra? One of the most beautiful sounds in the world. It begins with the first violin and then everybody starts tuning. At the end it sounds really awesome, but at the beginning it sounds like people are well, they're adjusting their tuning. It sounds like uh, this, this roar. And then it just comes together and it's clear. And that is what his voice sounds like. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said that I am the good shepherd and my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. Do you recognize his voice? Do you recognize the voice of of Jesus. Do you know what he's saying in the circumstances as they play out in your life? Verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars. This means that Jesus governs as king of his church. Yes. Dominion, his right hand at his fingertips, he just moves them and he's in charge. He governs. Isaiah 9, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Does he have rule over your life? I know that you believe in him, but does he govern your life? Have you given him the government of your life, of your finances, of your relationships, of your days, of your activities, of your joys. He wants to govern. Actually, he does govern. Amen. The problem is he wants you to align with his government. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Number six, Jesus protects his church as a warrior. A two-edged sword is a word that cuts and heals like a surgeon's scalpel. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert, he overcame that temptation by his word. He protected his ministry. He protected all of humanity when Satan said, if you bow before me, I will give you the kingdoms of this world. He came back with a sword. There was just no physical bleeding. But Satan lost then. And Satan lost again at Calvary forever. He fights for you. Exodus 14, 14 says, The Lord will fight for you, and you only need to be silent. Sometimes we like to take things in our own matters in our own hands, and we want our way of doing things to accomplish God's things, and He doesn't need you to do that. He just wants you to learn this sword. And you said, rightly, employ it, be skilled at it. This is what the sword that comes out of his mouth is, the word of God. Jeremiah 20, 11 says, but the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Another version says, as a mighty giant. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. David said that he trains his life for battle. 
David's song of deliverance found in 2 Samuel chapter 22. He says, the, uh, chapter yeah, 22, verse 33, God is my strong refuge and he has made my way blameless. He trains my hands for war, for you equip me with strength for the battle. You made my enemies turn their backs to me. The Apostle Paul encourages us to fight the good fight of what? Faith. Of faith. What battles are you fighting? There are battles in this life that are not for us to fight. The f- battle of me first. The battle of why not me. The battle of you filling the blank. Some battles are not worth fighting. Let's continue. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Number seven and last observation from this portion. Jesus transforms his church to his likeness. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. We were a couple of weeks ago in the book of Exodus. And we saw how Moses would meet with God. And he would come down. His face would glow. And it was more than people with like... Gucci fancy glass sunglasses could take, so they had to cover his face. Matthew 17 tells us of a very, very revealing, unveiling moment that took place. It says, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them. um, That was John, right here, that he's writing. And led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like like the sun. And his clothes became white as light. Do you see that? And behold, there appeared to be to them Moses and Elijah (laughs) talking with him. This nature that John is speaking of in the book of Revelation was already and was always in Jesus during his ministry. And here we see an account, a moment where he actually reveals, and he reveals it to only three of his disciples. And obviously, Peter is like, hey, should I make up a tent for all three of y'all? You're going to sleep here tonight? It was, it's great. Please go back, Matthew 17. You have to read that and allow that to sort of like This isn't a vision in the island of of Patmos. This is Jesus' ministry on this earth and Peter and John. And here comes Moses, who also was an Elijah, who saw no death. And 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 his face and his body glowed. A reality that is imminent. A foresight, the unveiling of things that are to come. Things seen and things unseen. This is what God wants us to be aware of, to be mindful of. This is a picture of transformation, right? Jesus in his earthly state, flesh and bone just like us, tempted in every way just like us. And for a moment he reveals, this is who I really am. That's amazing. After he resurrected, he would walk through the walls. And he would still eat with the disciples. And he he would appear to those two on the road to Emmaus. And he would walk just like one of them. And they didn't know what was happening, just having an interesting conversation that feels very different than anything they experienced before. And they noticed when he wasn't there anymore. Until Jesus returns in the clouds and every eye sees him, He's not going to allow you to see him visually because no one has seen God and lived, right? But can you say that you have experienced the trail of his presence? Haven't there been moments and instances in your life when you look back and you say, oh, he was there? I want, can I start again? Where did I go? He was there, and that just transforms us, isn't it? Doesn't it? Well, He has given us by faith 
by his perfect sacrifice, that nature, and he promises a resurrection, and a nature just like his, if we believe. But to this side, verse 17, John, sa John says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Overcome by fear, his understanding was maxed out. There was no more capacity, no more ram, no more margin for anything. And he's done. Heart rate is going up. John's reaction reveals the impact power of Jesus. An involuntary response is the most honest testimony of a reality, isn't it? I was driving on 95 the other, this week. I was coming from south. And you know that beautiful exit that we all love that begins around before Jackson Medical Center, that left lane? Can we have a moment of laughter over here for a moment? How long are they, is it going to take for them to give us two lanes on that road? That should have caused more irritation and, and cynicism. Do you know what I'm talking about? Every time you're A36 and you're going east, and there is a million cars that need to go 95 to go north, and there's only one lane. But there's only been one lane since 1973. <laughs> and it's 2021, and they're still telling us that they're going to fix it, right? Anyway, so I'm, I'm passing that, and there's all these cranes and all these things, and, and I'm going under bridges, and all of a sudden, I hear something that I interpret like a truck fell off the bridge and landed 20 feet away from me. A massive explosion. Boom! I couldn't explain it. Everything was shook. It wasn't that, thank God. Instead, it was a, can I, can, is a pastor call, allowed to call somebody a joker? Yes? No? Maybe? There's this Batman-looking car <laughs> that has two exhaust things, and it's going, bah! and then you, actual flames are coming out of this thing. I'm not kidding. People do this stuff. And the car happened to be next to me, and when it got in front of me, I'm like, oh, I see. But I jolted off my seat because I heard this explosion next to me, and my mind interpreted something completely crazy. And I, I, I'm not exaggerating. Someone owns a car like that, and he kept doing it, and people were looking like, what is this? To whatever. Go figure it out. Um, but that involuntary reaction of fear of what happened, right? That is the most honest testimony of what really things are. And so John is like, oh, this is too much for me to handle. I can't stand under this. And then Jesus responds, reveals his heart. But he, said, he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Jesus speaks from his heart. But Jesus reveals victory. Jesus inspires peace and a recovery from a debt-like state by the testimony of who He is. This is who I am. Do not fear. It is safe with me. I have been there. You're okay. I know that many of us, many of you, during this COVID and all the turmoil in this nation are oftentimes given to fear and the predictions and the threats and the things that you hear in the news. And even portions of this book, you're, you get sort of like, I, I can't take this. And I want you to hear this. The same Jesus that was in the midst of, of his church just 20 minutes ago. It's the same Jesus that observes that John is overcome Amen. by the effect of his power upon him. And he takes compassion and he puts his hand on him and he says, I am. 
it's okay. The comfort that you can take today goes beyond just, it's going to be okay, honey. But the comfort that you can take today is because who says it? And what he has done. And what he promises to be. John 16 says, Behold, behold the hour is coming. This is him on earth. Indeed it has come. You see how this sense of timing, one day we'll understand. When you will be scattered, each of you, to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet, I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Billy Graham was asked by senators many, many years ago, a couple of decades ago, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? To which he said, I am an optimist. I am an optimist because I have read the last chapter of the last book. And we win. He has overcome, and because he has overcome, we too will overcome. So there's no need for fear. There's no need to be troubled. In these days, whatever may happen tomorrow, you may have friends that will leave you, but you're not alone. You may have family members who don't want to talk to you for whatever reason, but you're never alone. For Jesus is in the midst of his church. He is in your trials. He intercedes for you. He fights for you as a warrior. He's sanctifying you. you. He's purifying you. He's glorifying you for eternity with him. Amen? Amen? Let us stand. Let us